welcome to this week's video. For this week, I'm going to be doing my wrap up for the month of August and let's say September as well, because we're almost uh, towards the end of September. Um, so this will be a uh, look at the books that I read in the month of mostly August um, and a little peek at what I'm reading now. So I will say August was a fantastic reading month. I was very, very happy with um, the books that I read in August. Um, the, my, the, my audio pick wasn't, um, I wish I had enjoyed it more, but I DNF'd it. And um, I know that it's sacrilege because it was, I'll bring it up here. It was, I'm going to do my, I usually do my paperbacks first, but I'm going to do my paperbacks last because there's one particular paperback that I want to read a little from that um, I loved so much and it's actually a nonfiction pick. But first for my um, audio, this is, sounds sacrilegious to say, but I DNF'd uh, Nora Roberts's Hideaway. And... The reason that I DNF'd it was because um, I, I liked the premise and I loved how it started. That's Nora Roberts's Hideaway. Um, I love the premise. I love how it started. Um, the only thing is that um, I love the whole part with like the little girl. Um, it's it's around like this family, this wealthy family, this um, sort of like film dynasty of um, people like in the, uh, this family that made a career in the film industry, and um, their one of their little girls gets kidnapped, and uh, she is then later supposed to grow up. Uh, as the heroine of the novel. So it starts off when she's little and gets kidnapped. Um, and that was all great. I loved that. I love that whole part of her. And she's like this smart, strong little girl whose mother is actually behind the kidnapping because she was being blackmailed because she was having an affair. So <laughs> it was just this bizarre, like, the mother was a horrible person. <laughs> um, and, um, it, uh, the little girl obviously gets away and, you know, she, she escapes on her own. Like this little, she's so smart and like self-reliant that she actually manages to escape on her own and, uh, gets back to the family. And then, uh, you find out that the mother was behind it. And, um, the, the reason I DNF'd it was because I found that after the kidnapping, it, dragged like I wanted to the story was about her and her the kidnapping and and um then like she grows up and and I guess falls in love with the little boy that um who she met as a little boy um who helped her uh when she escaped um but there was this whole like part where like you're learning basically the life story of the arresting officer and his partner. Um, and it just dragged with them. And I just, like, I, I, I don't care. I don't want to know about them. I want to know about her and her story. And there was this scene, I DNF'd it when the scene with the plea bargain deal with the kidnappers went on and on. And they were talking about uh, taking it to trial or not taking it to trial. And it was just going on and on. I was like, I, life's too short. Life's too short. I have too many books to read. DNF. So unfortunately, I DNF that one. Um, I also think that I am going to be DNFing the current audiobook that I am reading. And that is Danielle Steele's The Wedding Dress. And again, same sort of thing. I love the premise, but the thing with like the thing with Danielle Steele's books that I find, and maybe when when I was younger, like I didn't care as much, but 
I just find that she tells you everything. She tells you that they met and fell in love and uh, he, she went to visit him and they had a wonderful time and they were joyous in their love to you. I'm like, don't tell me that. Show me that with scenes. Show me that with them actually having a conversation. Like, and it's just, it can't, I can't get invested in Danielle Steele's uh, books now at this point in my life. Um, because it's just, she's telling you everything instead of like describing it like in the book and like through scenes where you can like get immersed in the story. I just, so unfortunately, again, love the premise of, um, this, this dress that like gets passed down from generation to gener generation. Um, and yeah, just, I, unfortunately that did not work for me. Ebooks were awesome. Uh, let me see, I shall show you the first one that I wanted to talk about is Mia Sheridan's Archer's Voice. Now I heard a lot up and down about this book and people praising it and I loved it as well. And I just want to bring up the cover here for you. Um, it is a story about a young man who, as a child, he is, let me see if I can get the cover. Um, he is, um, his, his, uh, mother and his father die because his father, that's Mia Sheridan's Archer's voice. Uh, and I think I'm actually going to buy a paperback copy of this book because I want it on my keeper shelf. Um, he is a, um, mute because as a child, uh, he was shot and um, his parents uh, die. His father was an abusive ass, which we find out. I'm gonna try not to spoil it, but <laughs> his father was an abusive ass and um, he uh, ends up being raised by this uh, uncle who's a little eccentric and uh, he himself is sort of like shunned by the uh, his community. Um, because he's, because he's mute and, um, they, uh, like, he doesn't interact with them and they don't interact with him, so he's sort of raised in kind of isolation, um, and he meets this girl who is, has lost her father in a robbery, and, um, so she's sort of there to sort of just, um, recuperate from that trauma and she meets him and they fall in love and it's this beautiful love story. <laughs> it is such a beautiful, beautiful story. I cannot recommend it enough. Um, yeah, uh, just again, I don't want to spoil, but towards the end, I thought it was going to end one way and I'm very happy that it didn't end that way because I would have been very upset but it was just uh, a beautiful, beautiful story and um, totally, totally recommend it. Um, my other ebook of awesome was, get the cover for this, The Marcus of Mayhem by Scarlett Scott. And I just think that's that's an awesome name. I love that name, Scarlett Scott. Uh, likely a pen name, I think. But um, and it's Sin Sins and Scoundrels, book three, and it's the title is Marcus of Mayhem, and it's a dude who is uh, taken prisoner. It's, it's historical. You couldn't tell from the cover. It's historical, and it's this dude who's taken prisoner uh, and tortured and decides that he's going to get revenge on on the people let me get back to the book that i was reading 
on uh, the people and the man who he believes is responsible for his kidnapping and his imprisonment and torture and all that, and take revenge on the man by seducing his sister. Now, this is not a new plot. This is not a new trope, but I'm okay with that. I enjoy it. It's wrong and it's inappropriate and I totally acknowledge that and I don't care. I don't care. Let me read what I want to read. Um, and so yeah, and he's determined to seduce her and ruin her so that the, bro the brother will be forced to fight a duel with him and so that he can kill the brother. Uh, so dishonor the sister and kill the brother. That is, that is his plan, but of course, feelings. Always the feelings. And um, I, I loved this book. She was, the heroine was awesome because she sort of always lived life on the sidelines because she um, has a, a handicap and I think she has a limp. And uh, she's always felt sort of apart from society and uh, never really um, uh, you know, like in, in like accepted. And she would, um, you know, she, she, they, they sort of like just shunned her and then like treated her badly. Um, but she has this wonderful sort of, you know, she's shy and withdrawn, but she's very strong. She's very strong and, and she's so loving and so warm and just completely brings our hero to his knees, which is what I love about these inappropriate stories. <laughs> um, and again, there's the whole issue with like, oh, you know, you shouldn't, women shouldn't have to save men and, and like, yes, you know, we know that and uh, like, we know, we know if you're not a stupid idiot, you know that if a guy treats you like crap, in real life, you would drop kick this guy off a bridge. You would drop kick this guy off a bridge and have nothing to do with him. Hopefully, you would be sensible enough to know that. Now, I know that there are women out there who are not this sensible, but I'm talking about for myself. I love reading about it. I make no apologies. <laughs> Um, so those were my favorite, um, so I would say the audio, the audiobooks was a little bit of a fail. Ebooks were wonderful. Now let's get to the paperbacks. Uh, I have one fiction and one nonfiction. Uh, with the, we'll start with the fiction first because I want to read a little bit from the nonfiction because I have to. Um, okay, so the first paperback was Jackie Collins' Lady Boss. And I was surprised that I hadn't read this book before because I love her Lucky books. You have uh, Chances and you have Lucky. And I forgot that Lady Boss was the third one in the Lucky series. And I had not read this one yet. Um, in this one, our beloved Lucky <laughs> makes some bad choices. Um, she decides, so she's married to Lenny who, we love Lenny, he's awesome, um, and, uh, it's everything that you love about Jackie Collins, R.I.P., still hurts, still hurts that she's not with us anymore, um, she died, I think, 2016, 17, um, passed away, and so that, that's unfortunate. Uh, and we still miss her very, very much. She was awesome. She was my fellow Outlander fangirl. We used to tweet about that together. And I miss her very, very much. Um, but Lady Boss was... Uh, <laughs> Lenny is uh, in, in like, he's comedian slash actor. And he's on <laughs> this movie that he hates. And because it's being run by this... A uh, team of asshats who are the son-in-laws of this mogul dude who sort of like stepped back and like he's getting on an age so he sort of stepped back and um, allowed his son-in-laws 
to run the studio and they run it sort of into the ground like it's it's crap it's crap i know it's pulling it's pulling putting out crap movies um so he decides that he needs an overhaul like he needs he's gonna sell it and uh just get somebody else give it to somebody else because his son-in-laws are ruining it uh enter lucky lucky decides that because her husband is um being just treated so badly and just is being contracted to this horrible movie and that nobody is listening to him and she decides that she's gonna buy the studio as a gift for him but also because she wants it and she wants to run it and she wants to change it and she wants to get shit done her way which is to put out better movies and uh just be awesome as herself is however she does not tell lenny this because she thinks it'll be a great idea to surprise him so for <laughs> two weeks she goes undercover at the studio to sort of see how things are running and uh get as much information as she can before the takeover and see like who she's gonna fire and who she's gonna keep um so she's running around in secret from her husband not telling him what she's doing he's like freaking out and it's causing like immense tension in their marriage but she thinks oh it's okay he's gonna forgive me when he finds out that i'm giving him this studio that's not what happens lenny gets a little bit upset because testosterone and male um gender roles and even though like he knows that he's married to lucky he knows it but he's still you know he still wants to have himself be heard like he still wants he doesn't want to be overtaken with her he wants to be partners with her and her doing this makes him feel like they're not partners and it's it's a wonderful exploration of how sometimes you can be a strong woman and sometimes you can be like a strong man but communication is very important and sort of the effect of sometimes being like these two strong people you have to sort of learn the art of compromise and just sort of listening to each other instead of always wanting things your way and i think it's a wonderful exploration of their marriage um in the same sort of way that if you've read the black dagger brotherhood the the book where they they revisit beth and wrath uh because their first beth and wrath um were the first couple in the first book of the series of the black dagger brotherhood in dark lover and so they're the first couple and they get their happily ever after but then in the book i believe the king they revisit Beth and Wrath, and it's um, kind of kind of an exploration of when you get your happily ever after. You know that doesn't mean that the life is perfect, and love is perfect, and I think this sort of does this does it very well as well. I love that book, The King, by in the Black Dagger Brotherhood series. Completely, completely recommend that series if you love vampires and, and par paranormal um definitely recommend the black Brother dagger brotherhood series um so that book for is the exploration of beth and wrath's marriage the king was fantastic and this one was absolutely fantastic in my opinion the same way even though there's no vampires in this book <laughs> unless you count 
um, studio vampires, like studio bloodsuckers <laughs> and uh, wealthy, um, manipulative, metaphorical bloodsuckers. There are plenty of that in here. Um, and I loved her friendship with Venus Maria. Oh my god. <laughs> I love this, because I know, like, in later books that they become, like, best friends. Um, uh, yeah. Venus Maria is an, she's a actress slash singer slash dancer slash everything. Um, and she and Lucky become friends. I think this is, like, yeah, this is the beginning of their friendship. Um, so yeah. Now, I'm so excited about this book. My next paperback is a nonfiction. It is a biography of one of my favorite people to follow on Twitter. And if I say the words Nellie Olson, you'll know if you're a child of the 80s, you'll know exactly who I'm talking about. The autobiography of the actress who played Nellie Olson, Allison Arngrim, Confessions of a Prairie Bitch. Y'all, this book was awesome! I cannot e e express the awesomeness that was awesome in this, in these pages of awesome. You get a behind the scenes look at working on Little House on the Prairie, which was a much beloved show in the 80s that we all grew up with. Um, and if you can get it on, you can get it on DVD now. So, oh my God, please do. Because it's this fr frontier family and there's there's heart there's humor there's everything there's children falling into wells there's just there's angels on mountains um they, oh it's just fantastic 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 um there is a more than a bit of a religious bent to it uh Christian, Episcopalian, Protestant, we're not sure, <laughs> but uh, under the umbrella, I guess, of Christianity. Uh, and uh, it's, it's hallmarky. It gets hallmarky, uh, but it was a fantastic show. The, this book, y'all, Alison Arngrim went through some shit. She went through some shit. And it's heartbreaking, and it's, but she dealt with it with, with the balls that she had, that she brought to Nellie Olson, and she is just an inspirational woman, um, and this biography is heartbreaking, it's funny, um, and particularly, <laughs> there's one section that I have to read, and it's um, a few pages so bear with me but this is for us this is for us us little house fans who grew up with the show and we know these characters and this is her take on some of the major players that we have all known and loved so we start with charles ingles played by the incomparable, may he rest in awesome, awesome peace, Michael Landon, Charles Ingalls. The poor but proud farmer, carpenter, and patriarch of the Ingalls family. In the original books by Laura Ingalls Wilder, he is the all-perfect pa, hero to nine-year-old girls everywhere. But as played by Michael Landon, he is transformed into the big hunk on the prairie, <laughs> stripped to the waist, glistening with sweat, and grabbing his wife around the waist with a Lust not normally publicly displayed in the 1800s, but don't buy the Macho Man act completely. Charles also cries real tears in every other episode, and this is true. Caroline Ingalls, played by the 
incandescently beautiful Karen Grassley. The epitome of the ideal American mother, Caroline is an endless font of unconditional love for her children, but she also won't take crap from anyone, especially Harriet Olson. My kind of woman. She can cope, excuse me, she can cope, whoops, no, I know this is the 80s, but no. <laughs> she can cook, sow, harvest crops, uh, harvest crops, heck, she even is prepared to cut off her own leg with a hot kitchen knife in an emergency. Oh my god, that episode traumatized me. Laura Ingalls Wilder, played by the beautiful and back then adorable Melissa Gilbert, the real star of this extravaganza, as the whole story is told through her eyes, she wrote the books after all. She's a freckled buck tooth every child, girl or boy, since she acts as her pa's surrogate son for most of her childhood, fishing, hunting, fighting, and spitting long distances. Despite her parents' attempts at a proper Christian upbringing, Laura refuses to stifle her, fear, her feelings of rage, joy, jealousy, or passion, or her right to act on them at any time. She's a fighter for truth, justice, and the American way. If Nellie Olson wants to start something, Laura will finish it. Mary Ingalls Ken Kendall, Melissa, played by the lovely Melissa Sue Anderson, the beautiful blonde-eyed, blonde, excuse me, blue-eyed, and later blind as a bat, older sister of Laura, an eternal goody-goody who does her chores and gets straight A's. Mary can also be counted on, always be counted on, to tell Laura that she's wrong, then run off to rat her out to their folks. Eventually, she manages to bag the most ridiculously hot blonde guy ever born. Adam Kendall. They start their own school for the blind, which later burns to the ground, killing their baby. Mary temporarily loses her marbles, then regains her sanity, only to have her husband miraculously get his sight back, threatening their marriage. Carrie Ingalls, played by the adorable, if accident prone, Lindsay and Sydney Greenbush. An adorable, but extremely accident prone. <laughs> Dumpling of a child with no visible neck and a serious communication problem. Baby Carrie regularly falls into wells, mine shafts, outhouses, etc., and even manages to accidentally take off in a runaway hot air balloon. She smiles and gurgles seemingly up to the age of ten or so, speaking an un unintelligible dialect that only her family understands. In real life, Carrie Ingalls went on to become a successful real estate agent in South Dakota. Grace Ingalls played by the darling precious lemon drops, Brenda and Wendy Turnbaugh. Charles and Caroline's fifth and final, thank God, child. Another cute blonde, she is so young, we do not have as much insight into her personality, but on first glance, she's a genius <laughs> compared to Carrie. <laughs> Jack, the brave yet floppy family dog who was replaced by Bandit when he died in season four. Amazingly, he complete, he, continued to appear in the closing credits long after his death, watching after the Ingalls, Ingalls girls as a ghostly presence. Albert Quinn Ingalls, played by the amazing Matthew, I'm going to pronounce this wrong, Laberto. I think I pronounced that wrong. I'm sorry. Orphaned Albert is a street waif, stealing, a stealing, gambling, artful dodger type that Charles brings into the Ingalls family. Sad-eyed, with pouty lips, he's a magnet for tragedy. If someone is going to accidentally burn down a building, befriend a teenage rape victim, get addicted to morphine, or come down with a bizarre fatal disease, it's this kid. He's such a hit, it starts ghastly irreversible it starts a ghastly irreversible trend on the show. Dozens of orphans and lost children being taken in by the Ingalls, the Edwardses, and eventually even the Olsons. James Cooper Ingalls and Cassandra Cooper Ingalls, played by Arrested Development's Jason Bateman and Missy Francis. Jason Bateman as a little bull haired, adorable precious blueberry who grows up to be hot AF. Part of the tribe of the orphans who populated the show in his last in its last years, their parents die in a horrible buggy crash. The episode is even called The Lost Ones, in case any of us missed the point. Nels Olson played by the ever-patient Richard Bull. Proprietor of the Mercantile, the only store in town. Sure, there's a feed and seed, but if you're buying anything for humans and not horses, this is the place. A kind, sensible, slightly sad-looking man 
Nels tries to run a fair business, make a profit, and still help the less fortunate while enduring the total insanity of his crazy wife, bitchy daughter, and spaced out son. Harriet Olsen. The Queen Bee! She... A frontier Alexis Colby, if you will. <laughs> the farm version of Alexis Colby from Dynasty. Played by the incomparable Catherine McGregor. The, imp the imperious co-proprietor of the mercantile. Mrs. Olsen attempts to control everyone and everything in Walnut Grove with positively grand operatic gestures and terrifyingly emotional outbursts. As seen through nine-year-old Laura's eyes, she is every child's nightmare. The archetype, uh, the archetype of the school headmistress, the evil stepmother, the wicked witch. Her greatest pleasure is spoiling her daughter Nellie, whom she has made into her own personal Barbie doll on the pra prairie. Nellie Olsen. Oh, she who has written the book, Alison Arndrum. Nellie decides to take out her misery on everyone in her path. Okay, maybe I'll look, I'm a little prejudiced here, but can you blame her for being cranky? She's stuck in a small town in the middle of nowhere in the 1800s with a bossy mother, an insipid brother, and a Shirley Temple dude that she's forced to wear way past puberty. She's bored, frustrated, and ridiculously overdressed for the climate and the occasion. Feisty new girl Laura Ingalls pisses her off from the day one, starting a seven-year spiral of cruelty, backstabbing, blackmail, and terror. Willie Olson, played by the adorable precious cupcake that was Jonathan Gilbert. Nellie's small, weakling, not quite all their baby brother, clearly the runt of the litter. He makes the perfect henchman, happily doing her bidding, if only to have something to do. Percival Dalton, played by the darling Steve Tracy. May he rest in peace, this darling man. Five feet, four inches, and all man. Don't let the glasses in the conservative suits fool ya. Percival does not run from a fight. In his first episode, he achieves national hero status by telling Mrs. Olsen to zip her lip. Brought in to teach Nellie how to run her hotel, he wins her heart, not just because he loves her, but because he's the first to expect anything of her. She falls madly in love and becomes <gasps> nice. He proposes to her in the middle of the street and informs Mrs. Olsen there will be no church wedding because I'm Jewish, causing her to nearly fall out the window. He and Nellie opt to raise their twins, Benjamin and Jennifer, in a mixed faith household. I love their whole story so much. Oh my God, I cannot even. Adam Kendall, played by the hot AF Linwood Boomer. Blind Mary's way hot hubby, who at first is a blind teacher, then becomes blind lawyer, then a sighted lawyer. All their children die. Almanzo Wilder, played by the also hot AF, Dean Butler. The blonde, earnest, plain talking guy known as Manly, who marries Laura. He is, he's the Wilder in the infamous Laura Ingalls Wilder name. But despite his best efforts, he's overshadowed by Laura, both on the show and in history. It's all too clear who's driving the covered wagon in their relationship. Manly will also never be as manly as Pa. He's manly in his own way, I, I would say, in my personal opinion. Miss Eva Beadle, played by the wonderful Charlotte Stewart, the teacher we all wish we had. This is true. Everyone wants to bring her an apple, and she's the type who will always graciously thank them, even if she's got a bushel out back. Always patient and kind, she never berates her students unless they truly deserve it. She's the woman who taught one of America's most famous authors to read and write. Dr. Hiram Bacon, Baker, oh, this poor dude, <laughs> played by Kevin Hagen. Poor Doc Baker. He tries so hard, but it's the 1870s. There are no antibiotics, no x-ray machines, no ultrasound. They hadn't even discovered an antidepressant yet, for heaven's sakes. He's smart and makes some very impressive educated guesses, occasionally keeping a few of his patients alive. But generally, the poor guy's got nothing. You get sick, you die. Being a doctor in the 1800s totally sucked. Reverend Robert Alden, played by the adorable Dabs Greer. May he rest in peace. 
it's never been clear what denomination the church in Walnut Grove was. Lutheran, Methodist, they're the most they're the most likely for that time and location. But with Reverend Alden, it could be anything. He manages to work in a lot of an awful lot of 1970s liberated church type talk for a Protestant minister in the 1800s. And he somehow keeps the congregation from getting bored, even though they seem to sing the same four hymns over and over for nine years. <laughs> this is true. Isaiah Edwards, played by the without equal Victor French. May he rest in damn peace, this man. He's the bearded, dagnabbit consarn, backy chow. <laughs> <laughs> Chug Swillin, best friend of the Ingalls family. He even has his own theme song, Old Dan Tucker! We see if I remember it. Old Dan Tucker was a fine old man, lost his face in a frying pan, stole something from a wagon wheel, died with a toothache in his heel. Get out the way for Old Dan Tucker, it's too late to get his supper. Supper's over and dinner's cooking. Old Dan Tucker just stands there looking. <laughs> I am sorry, not sorry for that. Um, famous for teaching Laura to spit. Amazingly, he later gets married to a very attractive woman, Grace Snyder, and adopts three kids. Grace Snyder Edwards, played by the lovely Bonnie Bartlett, the widowed postmistress who somehow decides that Mr. Edwards is a good catch. Maybe she's turned on by guys with beards. She's proper, but with a sense of humor. Between Mr. Edwards and the tribe of orphans, she'll need it. John Sanderson Edwards. I am so sorry, I'm gonna butcher this name. Radames Pere. Para. Radames Para. Yes, the oldest adopted son of Isaiah and Grace. He is handsome, high cheekbone sensitive art. Uh, he's a handsome, high cheekbone sensitive artist type. Uh, AF as well. A real tree hugger. He flunks hunting and all that pioneer stuff, but teaches his dad to read. He goes on to become a writer and has an ill-fated romance with that uptight Mary Ingalls. I believe he dies. I believe he dies and then Mr. Edwards like becomes an alcoholic. I could be wrong. Uh, Carl Sanderson Edwards and Alicia Sanderson Edwards, Brian Part and Kyle Richards. The, the little orphans come in sets on this show so the Edwardses also get a cute, mischievous blonde boy and a doll-like little girl. Lars Hansen, by Carl, played by Carl Swenson. Why does anyone live in Walnut Grove anyway? Because of this guy, the founder of Walnut Grove and proprietor of the Hansen Lumber Mill, a classic yumpin' yiminy <laughs> Swedish character. He returns to Walnut Grove in later episodes to die with dignity in a dramatic two-partner, parter such as that episode. Right before the episode aired, Carl Swenson died in real life. May he rest in peace. John Carter, Sarah Carter, and their adorable kids, Jeb and Jason, played by Stan Ivar, Pamela Roy, La Roy Lance, Lindsay Kennedy, and David Friedman. David Friedman was a character in one of my books. <laughs> he's the, yeah, he's a character in, in one of my books. I like to realize David Friedman. With Michael Landon wanting to spend less time on the show in the last year, the Ingalls move out of the infamous little house and go to Iowa. Laura and Almanzo have long ago established their own homestead, so what are they supposed to do with the house? Tear it down? Sacrilege. Instead, a handsome blacksmith and his family arrive from New York just in time to move in and have all the same warm, laughing moments by the creek we're all accustomed to. Jenny Wilder, played by, oh yes, Shannon Doherty. Yes, that Shannon Doherty. Because Laura and Almanzo had to adopt someone too, didn't they? Jenny is played by a pre-90210, Shannon Doherty, who tries her damnedest to do an impression of Melissa Gilbert in the early years. She is part of the cloning process that took place in the last years of the show, where new little girls with braids fought new little girls with little ringlets. Let's see, but yeah. And lastly, we have the bane of my existence, because she has the same name I do, same first name. Nancy Olson. I write under E. Jamie, but my that's my pen name. My name name is Nancy Olson, played by Allison Olson. Speaking of clones, 
The Olsons are not left out of the orphan follies. After Nellie leaves, Mrs. Olson not surprisingly has a breakdown and can only be consoled by finding another blonde child to permanently screw up. She meets her match in Little Nancy, whose psycho bitchery is more closely modeled on the movie The Bad Seed. That section alone is worth getting this book. Just, oh my god. The rest of it is fantastic, but if you need a reason, if you are second guessing whether you should get it or not, that section alone is worth every penny. I just, oh my god. Just that sort of kind of like wry, sarcastic, snarky humor is throughout this book. She is wonderful. She's a wonderful writer. I have not seen her uh, comedy, because she sometimes does uh, stand-up comedy now. I have not seen it. I would love to see her if she ever came to Toronto. Um, and yeah, totally recommend it. And I cannot bow, I bow to Alison Arngrim for this book, for sharing the deepest, most heartbreaking moments of her life and balancing them with fantastic humor and wonderful, uh, wonderful little antidotes um, from the time that, uh, <laughs> that, the time that Melissa Gilbert got drunk on 7-Eleven slushies. Um, from the time where they were fighting in the mud and they had to pee in their wetsuits. Just fantastic, fantastic stories in this, in this book. So that is going to be it for this week's video. Um, oh, before I do that, let me show you what I'm reading right now uh, on... So I, in Audible, I was reading the uh, the wedding dress, listening to the wedding dress by Daniel Steele, but I, I'm gonna DNF it because I'm not getting invested because just her writing style just does not work for me, and I think that's gonna be it for me with Daniel Steele because her plots are amazing, but just the execution is just no, like can't get invested because her style. Uh, right now I am reading Anna J. McIntyre's Colson's Wife a Colson Family Saga series, and I believe it's the first book, and just, I love that cover, because it's set in the 20s, which is all up in my catnip, you know I'm all about the early 20th century, um, especially that, yeah, I love, I love, I love, I love, um, and so that's what I'm reading in ebook right now, um, and in in um, paperback, I have started another, another, I just realized it's another autobiography and memoir. I'm reading the, you can't tell by that, but it's <laughs> Frank McCourt's Angela's Ashes, which I totally enjoyed. I don't know if enjoyed the right, is the right word, because it's a fucking depressing movie. <laughs> it's about this little boy who is poor, in Ireland, and they're in Ireland, and it's raining all the time, and they're poor. That's the whole movie. <laughs> um, but yeah, I'm I'm about halfway through Angela's Ashes, um, and it's uh, it's what I'm I'm enjoying it very much. I his writing style, it like that, like it it's it sucks you in, like it you you get like little antidotes of his life and. Um, yeah, these, like, incredibly sad stories. Don't read this. Don't read this if you're looking to get cheered up. Don't. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, no, no. Um, yeah, so that's what I'm reading right now. Um, hopefully my Audible uh, pick for uh, next month uh, will do a little better. I'm not sure what I'm going to read yet in Audible, but that's what I'm reading so far. So. Um, I hope you enjoyed this video. Follow me on Twitter at twitter.com slash author ejamie. Like my Facebook page at facebook.com slash author ejamie. 
and I will talk to you guys next time. Bye.